Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I'm Paul TX141 Walsh, welcoming you to an all new World of Warships gameplay today on our channel. In this episode I'm saying how to need tier 7 Soviet light cruiser, Man's the Shores, in a tier 7 domination game on the map Neighbours. The focus of today's gameplay is for me to provide you with my informal review of the Shores and I feel that this gameplay is a brilliant demonstration of the pros and cons of this light cruiser. Now we can read a lot into the ship's characteristics from the opening tactics I'm going to deploy, and that is I'm going to work towards Objective Alpha rather than Objective Charlie. Now the logic behind this is, normally I would go to Charlie in a much more manoeuvrable cruiser, not in terms of speed, but in terms of ability to nip around land masses and keep close to land masses. As we can see the Shores is a big ship, she dwarfs some battleships that she can encounter. And when we look at a turn circle radius of 900 meters, there's going to be a large number of battleships that she'll see who are going to be proud that their radii are significantly smaller. The Shores is not a ship that enjoys being packed into a close space, and when it's in a close quarters gun situation, it's going to have a bit of difficulty angling continuously or dodging the incoming torpedoes because of her large profile and her rather clumsy handling. Do keep in mind you can only get your rudder shift time down to 7.1 seconds with the upgraded hull and the rudder shift module upgrade, which means throwing the ship about and changing its directionality takes time and can be punished. She's a clumsy handling ship, but what you also have to keep in mind is she is a fast ship, with her top speed being 35.5 knots without the speed flags equipped. This means she can dart around the battlefield, and more on that in a bit. Now as we make our way towards Alpha, we have to keep in mind what our team are doing and that's standard for all cruisers. Here we can see the majority of our team are making their way towards Charlie, we've got some elements going towards Bravo, and we've got a limited element, including ourselves, going towards Objective Alpha. Now the logic behind this, and this will bring us on to our second point, the Shores is not a ship that can push objectives. Now this comes down to a number of principles, but the main one is she doesn't have the armour profile to do so. She has a maximum amount of armour of 100mm, going all the way down to a minimum of 13mm, but more importantly, her citadel rides above the waterline significantly, whereby it's only got 75mm of armour, and that means that this ship can be citadeled out to significant ranges by even enemy destroyers going out to say 7.5km. In return, your survivability in this ship is going to depend heavily on you being able to keep your distance from your foes, and on top of that angle appropriately to the incoming fire. So charging willy nilly into an objective to contest it can prove rather fatal, seeing as you have the combination of a lack of armour and the rather poor manoeuvrability in being able to turn the ship onto target or angle it against incoming fire. But when you keep to longer distances, that's where you can outwit your opponents in being able to dodge the incoming fire, despite your large profile, pull the distance and continuously rain down fire. And that's where we're going to see that come into play shortly. Now in terms of long range fire, what I mean is, your 16.8km maximum range without considering your spotting aircraft that pushes it towards 20km means that you can do something like this. Shoot an enemy destroyer that's taking the central objective, despite the fact you're all the way out towards the southwestern objective. And whilst we're not going to rip that aircraft to pieces, we are going to score a couple hits, providing a brilliant example of this. Add to that your initial muzzle velocity on both shell types of 950 meters per second, you've got Russian railguns here mean that you can hit targets even out to the longest of distances rather reliably, as long as you've got a keen eye for what your opponent's doing. And of course, as you do have torpedo tubes, you can use those to see what your opponent is doing in terms of the torpedo lead indicator, as what we did against the air glare. But now we have to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against an enemy Nuremberg. But we're already turning away, and I was already getting ready to turn away. Based on logic, we hadn't seen too many ships going towards Objective Charlie on the enemy team, so the majority must be going towards Alpha, so I needed to be ready to pull away from that situation. And it's a good thing I turned when I did, because there's a lot of battleships coming this way. Now, focusing on the Nuremberg, we can see as we pull the distance, we can reliably continue to hit this enemy German cruiser, whereas they and their friendly shores are struggling by comparison. Because as we pull the distance, we can start to pull off the number of shots that are going to successfully hit. Because what we have to consider is we can start to achieve the angles, we can start to wiggle our aft, and therefore we can reduce the likelihood of being hit, despite our large size. Now in return, as we're continuously throwing out high explosive, we can see we're constantly resetting the cap progress of the Nuremberg, and on top of that, we're starting to set multiple fires. And whilst fire damage isn't as significant on cruisers anymore, the combination of this fire damage plus our raw high explosive alpha damage maximising to 2200 means that Nuremberg's not going to be in a very fit health state if this carries on, whereas we've only lost approximately just over a quarter of our health on the relative scale. 
and with the Nuremberg crippled down to their last 10,000 health, they're wiped out of the game by one of our friendly battleships. Our friendly Koenig, good shot by them. And this is where we start to come into the concept of the speed of the shores. Now remember I said that this is a fast ship, 35 and a half knots maximum speed, and it's got very powerful guns in terms of their gun range, i.e. these 6 inch guns are able to extend to a significant enough distance to look how far I've pulled away from Alpha, but I'm still keeping the leading enemy Koenig within my gun range just about, as they push nose in towards objective Alpha from the eastern edge. This means I can really start to punish that enemy Koenig from a long distance, to the point where their dispersion, which is naturally poor, as they're a German battleship, is going to work even more against them, and this is where I can kick up a layer of frustration on that enemy battleship, in the fact that I can start to just make my way merrily around the map, at a distance of out to say 15 kilometers, if not longer, and continuously frying the fire against the enemy battleship, and in return, they haven't really got the ability to be able to reliably hit me, so long as I do not give a consistent broadside to them albeit I am being shot every so often by the enemy shores in the rear. And this means I can keep setting fires on this enemy Koenig, and I can zip around at such a speed that when I am targeted, as priority target is telling me I'm being targeted, the tier 1 captain skill, I can start to take evasive action, angling my ship one way, then angling it another way, knowing when to and when not to angle the ship. And in terms of fire chance, what you're seeing here is we have a 15% fire chance. We're using Demolition Expert, the tier 3 captain skill, and we're also using the appropriate fire setting flags. We do not have IFHE equipped, however, and this is where we start to see a bit of a contrast in fortune. Now, when we've been hitting the enemy Coney, realise how many shatters we've been getting. And that is because, remember, you are a light cruiser, not a heavy cruiser. A good number of cruisers at tier 7 switch to 8-inch guns or higher calibre. I mean, their penetration values on their high explosive shells are significantly larger compared to the Shores, where the Shores only has the ability of its high explosive to penetrate 25mm of armour. So that means, because of the 1 6th of the shell calibre, 152 divided by 6 is 25.3 recurring, our opponents must have deck armour of 24mm or less for us to penetrate it and successfully get through it and do damage. Meanwhile, in the case of the two Koenigs, who have 30mm of deck armour in the majority of cases, and on top of that the enemy Colorado who has 25 we need the IFHE Captain Skill at Tier 4 to be able to actually penetrate reliably with our high explosive and get the damage off that we crave. Otherwise we need to be targeting the superstructure, or alternatively the fore and aft end of the deck armour, which is sometimes a little bit weaker. So instead we are reliant on being able to continuously dish out the fires, and we've already set 9 fires in this game, that goes to show how we've been rather fortunate, but at the same time we've been so intrinsically focused on fire setting. As I move towards the landmass here, here's an example of me having to dodge around the landmass, and the overall size of the shores is going to make that a little bit more difficult compared to other cruises that I could sail in, such as the New Orleans. We do avoid the landmass, but I had to drop a load of speed to make sure I didn't hit the landmass. Unfortunately, our Anju and Koenig are out the front are providing a screen with which I can just pull back from. Now, if I had IFHE equipped, by comparison, I would have the ability to penetrate 32mm with my high explosive shells, or 32.93 recurring if you go through the full calculation. But regardless, that would give me the ability to not only set fires at a 12% chance, if I remember correctly, the penalty on the fire chance, but on top of that, be able to do the raw high explosive damage the maximised out to 2,200, or in the case of the armour piercing, you'll sit still for 3,300. But really the armour piercing isn't that strong in my experience. While well, it can be reliable against cruisers who give broadside from 10 kilometres or less, particularly very lightly armoured cruisers such as the Nuremberg or the tier 7 American Premium, the Atlanta, but in general your armour piercing only really starts to come into a world of its own once you get down to say 7 kilometres or less. Distances at which if you start giving a broadside, even destroyers with a lot of calibre guns are going to really start punishing your broadside, the case of say the Minsk at tier 7, your Soviet counterpart. Now we set another fire on the rearward Koenig with the lead one already falling, and that means we're up to 13 fires already. So we're really trying to set everything on fire, the whole world's going to burn down around us. But speaking of things burning down around us, know how much distance we've pulled from Alpha, but at the same time we've lost our guys who are in the front. And this is where the difficulty also comes in the shores. It's been very powerful in a kiting role. Note how we've been using our friendly battleships to act as a screen in order for us to be able to just pull the distance and keep lobbing out shells, with our base reload of 8 seconds brought up to speed a little bit through the Adrenaline Rush Tier 2 Captain skill. And we've lost approximately half of our health now, so that's really starting to kick in. But the downside of this is once you lose your teammates who are no longer able to spot the enemy ships for you, or alternatively they're just no longer being shot at by the enemy ships, and therefore the enemy ships are spotting themselves for you, 
It means now you have to really think about, well, how do I spot my opponents, but at the same time, I don't put myself in a situation where I'm going to get ripped to pieces? Because the concealment of the shore's base is not great. Well, as you're seeing it here, you have a detectability by sea of 129 kilometers, and by air, it's 8.1 kilometers, and when flying from within smoke, it's 6.7 kilometers. Now, fortunately for us, we've let the enemy Coney get a little bit closer. I mean, we're able to spot them through their base concealment values. And we've been waiting for this. Note where we're positioning ourselves on the map. We pulled all the way back into spawn and we're just keeping the Koenig within its spotting distance to so make sure we can continuously throw out the salvos and try to go for additional fires. Now the downside of this of course is now I'm becoming detached from my team, what's left of my team. And I've had to sacrifice teammates in order to be able to get into this situation. I've been pulling back because I've been targeted, I can see that by a priority target, four ships targeting me right now. And remember what I said about the armor profile of the ship earlier? It's rather bad. Well, I don't want to risk getting hit on the broadside by armor piercing. And I don't want to get too close because then I've got to do a 180 degree reversal and try to dodge the potential citadel damage that may be coming. So I'm really caught out here, but fortunately for me, an MML Batin's been baited to charge after me, to me with their top speed of 39 knots and therefore get within range to spot themselves through firing at me. And in return, that means I can start to use my superior gun power at such a distance in order to be able to cut them down. We're having to dodge a landmass here. We didn't really anticipate this landmass until too late. And note how I'm having to cut around it and throw away my ability to hit the Emil Batin for some time. Also being shot at in the rear by the enemy shores from earlier. And they're not really too much of a problem. We're keeping them at maximum range as we set a fire on the Batin. And hopefully we have finished them off. As we cut behind the landmass. And that should be enough. There we go. So that's an enemy cruiser out of the way, albeit a tier 5 one. And this shores that's following us a little bit longer is really becoming a bit of a pain in our backside, but do realise how they're not really getting too consistent damage on us. And in return, as we haven't found them, they have to charge after us if they want to be able to hit us, and it means we can get much more reliable damage out on them. Six hits by comparison there, picking up 3,000 damage. And that's where the shores works very well in the fact that if it's allowing people to chase after it, it can continuously rain down at least six guns on the target, if not 12, whereas the foes will be chasing with their lead guns only. And for example, the enemy shores there is only able to use six guns on us compared to our ability to use 12 in return on them. But again, note how long the game has gone on for now, 12 minutes, and the fact that whilst we've done a considerable amount of damage, 96,000, this game is not turning in our team's favour. And I haven't been able to exactly push into a situation. I haven't been able to create an initiative for my team to try and exploit. And that's where the profile of the ship works against itself because we don't have the armor to do so. Now you may be thinking at this point, well at some point it's got to buy and you do have to push in. Well you do have to keep in mind you do have some pushing capability. You can equip Hydroacoustic Surge. Alternatively, we've got Defensive AA here and I'm using that simply because I'm focusing on the long range engagements and therefore being picked on by carriers in open water. But you could go with Hydroacoustic Surge. I personally prefer not to. And you've also got Torpedo Capacity. You've got the ability to have two quadruple sets, one to each side of the ship, whereby they only have a range of four kilometers, which means your torpedoes, apart from acting as a lead indicator, or when you're in those do or die situations at extremely close range, they're not exactly going to be the most useful tools compared to say the six kilometer torpedoes on your tier seven German counterpart of the York. So instead what you have to consider is these torpedoes are more of a last ditch attempt. They do have a 70 knot top speed, which means they can get to the target ludicrously fast and they're very dangerous and they have a 101 second reload, so they're not reloading any time soon. But they will do a maximum damage of 15,100 per hit, which is always nice. So we can't exactly use the torpedoes to push in, so what I'm having to do at this point is actually reveal myself to the enemy shores, for example, and get them to shoot at me so they'll spot themselves, and in return, by doing so, I can now start to pull the distance, and we can have another trade in war. And what you're going to see is, whilst the enemy shores at first gets a rather nice set of hits on me, over time, this engagement worked into my favor because they spotted themselves to me to spot themselves for my teammates and in return by setting fires and doing the high explosive damage as they were trying to chase after me quite and away from them, it means that they've had to expose themselves to incoming fire from me and in return I'm not taking the damage back in return. Now I could be switching to the spotter plane at this point, I do agree, but I'm not going to because what I'm actually going to do is use the fact that this Colorado is pushing in to bring the Colorado into gun range. I just need to reposition myself to deal with the Atlanta as well, who seems to be pushing quite close to objective Charlie. And I feel that with the spotter plane at close ranges, it really throws my aim off currently. So I'm trying not to resort to the spotter plane until I get a very long time on target. And we can see that the 
Colorado is no longer being spotted, and the spotter plane wouldn't have been close enough to spot the Colorado for us. In turning in towards Charlie now, I'm having to make a decision whereby I need to actually go back after the enemy team, because it looks as though my teammates are not really in the position to push anymore, especially seeing as they've got a Shiratsuyu, a very dangerous tier 7 Japanese destroyer, in amongst their numbers, which means it could pop up anywhere in Torpedo any one of us. Again, our lack of maneuverability means we're susceptible to torpedoes, and we have very little torpedo reduction built. In fact, we don't even have a torpedo belt from what I remember, so we can't reduce the damage we take, and that's why our Citadel is rather exposed. And that means torpedoes are going to be the bane of our existence if we happen to take one. So instead, what I'm going to do is make my way back out towards the northern side of the map, create an alternative firing angle, and try to exploit the angles or the spotting provided to me by my teammates. And here we go, the Colorado is spotted, and I'm going to go for some fires on it. And note again the number of shatters I receive due to the fact I do not have IFAG equipped when I'm hitting the deck armor of the enemy Colorado. Nine hits there, eight shatters. Here's another salvo going in. Another six hits, only two penetrated. The New York, on the other hand, does not have the deck armor to be able to cause my shells to shatter typically, unless I hit the turret. The New York, by comparison, have 19 millimeters all over the central deck, which means I can rain down fire on them willy-nilly, five penetrations straight away. And this is a very comfortable situation to be in because we can just literally rip that battleship apart. Screwing one shatter there on one of the lead turrets, but it really causes them some problems because we can set the fires, plus just get through the deck as if it's no issue. Another two and a half thousand damage salvo there, plus the fire on top, means we can pick up our Confederate medal, and it's a wonderful situation to be in. And that's how that pesky Atlanta, which well, seems as though they're getting more and more aggressive into Charlie, and it's at this point they're against a like for like class of ship, i.e., the Atlanta being another light cruiser, and the fact that their initial muzzle velocity is much poorer compared to our own, I'm feeling confident that I can trade effectively with the Atlanta. They've been busy firing at our pins of color by the looks of things, so they'll still be reeling from the fact that they were spotted through firing, or they've got the higher detectability, and this is where we'll go to toe against them. And we'll be using our armor piercing here whilst they give a broadside to us, and we'll see that we can pick up some citadels and we'll pick up a rather meaty 5,000 damage salvo there. Tossing in the salvo, let's see if we can get them out of the game. Well, not quite, but we do get one citadel, and then switching back to high explosive as they start to angle towards us, this will be enough to finish them off. And that's the Atlanta out of the game, our second kill in the bag, and we've also picked up the high caliber. Now unfortunately, our team still seems to be losing ships, and I haven't been able to really link up with my teammates yet, and this is just as much foul play by myself as it is with my team just falling apart. And this is one of the drawbacks of the shores once again. Notice how I'm having to stay behind my team or stay in a position where I'm not really there to support my teammates because I've got the ability to use range against the enemy ships, but it's not very helpful if I don't head over towards my friendly Pensacola or turn to lead to my friendly Nice out. And this is something you can be baited into doing with the shores. You can become very disrupted and therefore taken aback from your team's positioning and you'll think that your team's abandoned you when actually it's you who abandoned your team. And I am trying to use the spotting conferred to me by my teammates here against this New York in order to rain down damage. And you can see I'm now closing the distance on the New York using the speed of the shores to get into a very nice firing position in open water north of Objective Bravo as they take out our friendly Night Owl. But it's really too late at this point. This game is the enemy teams now to throw away. And we do set a fire on the New York. And again, using that fire chance to our advantage, picking up even more damage. But really, there's not much left here. The Shirts are spotted briefly, we'll try and throw our salvo or two towards them. And again, if we get the lead right, we can do rather consistent damage at such long distance with our rail guns. But we can't always guarantee the hits on the target, and it looks as though Shirts are was a little bit faster than we may have anticipated. In wrapping up at this point, seeing that the shells missed the target, we're charging towards these battleships now. I'm thinking to myself, well, if I'm going to go all in, I might as well go all in. But really, I perhaps should have been a bit more aggressive in the halfway stage of the game in pulling back from Alpha, trying to stay a little bit close to Bravo and continuously rain down the fire. There could be a case argued as well that by not having IFHE, some ships were allowed to last a lot longer than they should have in open water, such as the Colorado, such as the two Koenigs, or at least they were in much better health states than they would have been if I'd have IFHE equipped. But really that's theorising, but what we can see here is I'm not able to make up the deficit now that time has had on this game with only a minute left and we'd really need to start sinking a good number of enemy ships in order to get our team back in the game at the last minute. It's just not possible. We've got a lot of shells coming in towards us from the New York, from the enemy shores. We'll have some shells coming in from the enemy Colorado shortly. Cutting our speed to dodge the incoming fire there. But really the game is at its end and we're just waiting for the score to go up to 1000 for the enemy team, setting another fire. 
Time for the post-game stats then, very shortly. A defeat in the end, but nonetheless a rather rewarding one. We can see our battle performance amounted to a total damage output of 156,449 HP, and we also picked up two heroic achievements. The Confederate for damaging at least six enemy ships, where damage caused to each ship must exceed 20% of their normal health pool, and the High Caliber for damaging at least four enemy ships, where the damage caused must exceed 30% of the total health pool of all the ships in the enemy team. In coming onto the team scores, we can see that we topped our team in terms of base experience earned, picking up 1,516, even beating the top player on the enemy team. But this all means nothing in terms of the victory, simply because our playstyle was incredibly selfish. Note that throughout the game, our concept was to try and harass the enemy ships with our long distance fire, being able to do so through our very strong initial fire and muzzle velocity, our railgun shell arcs, and our reliable 4x3 combination of firepower being able to just get out so much damage over time. Now against the battleships the reliability came more in the ability to set fires continuously, but it all built up in the end, but because we were trying to build up that damage by ourselves over time, it meant that we had to put the team on hold and we ignored the potential team play link up opportunities, particularly in the second half of the game. Note that in the first half of the game, we sacrificed our friendly Koenig and Iron Duke in order to give us the time to continuously throw out damage. Moving on to our detailed report, we have three key items to note here. The first is the number of fires we set and the damage caused by said fires. We set a total of 27, which to me is a personal record and goes to show how the continuous rain of high explosive fire meant that we could set a continuous stream of fires as a result and we almost picked up a wither for our efforts in setting fires and causing burn damage. This then brings us on to the number of enemy ships we hit over the course of the game, a total of 9, two of which we destroyed. This serves to highlight you have the ability in the shores to reacquire targets on the fly because of your wonderful range on your batteries, but on top of that as well you have to consider that your 180 degree turn time on your turrets is only 25 seconds which isn't too punishing and means that as you kite away from the enemy ships, you're able to switch the targets on the fly and bring about the damage and said fires. And this then brings us on to our third point, which is the total distance traveled in the time and distance category, 83.32 kilometers, a distance you perhaps typically see in a destroyer, and this serves to highlight how we use the speed of the shores in order to pull distance from the enemy team, move around the battlefield, and try to get into positions where we could bring about the firepower on the enemy ships. As for our credits and experience earned, we can see that after additions and deductions, we walked away with 212,636 silver credits and 4,617 commander experience. To conclude, if I had to summarise the shores in a single phrase, it would be background bully. At longer distances, she is a very powerful light cruiser and her ability in the long game to be able to continuously drop high explosive salvo after high explosive salvo on enemy ships at distances where their guns may not be able to even reach or at least reach reliably. And in return, this means that she can become a problem, particularly for battleships who start off with a lot of health but lose it over time simply through raw high explosive damage and subsequent fires. But the tables turn very quickly when the Shores pushes towards an objective and that she lacks the pushing power as despite having a very strong top speed, she doesn't have the maneuverability, the concealment or the armour to go with the concept of pushing the objective and if anything she should always be supporting her team in the push, not be the one commanding it. For being a bully, what may be found is that when she pushes towards an objective and gets too close to those she's been harassing, they may retaliate and give her a bloody nose. And so in TX141, and if you have enjoyed this video, why not leave a like, comment or subscribe for future World of Warships videos on my channel. And if you're looking to sign up to this game today, ladies and gentlemen, you can do so using the link in the description of this video. Remember it's free, and you may end up enjoying it. But until then, take care, fair seas.